Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears, for today we dive deep into the heart of Venice, where merchants bargain and hearts are weighed in balance with gold. The Merchant of Venice, a tale that challenges the very fabric of humanity, justice, and the complexities of society. An introduction as grand as I would expect from the bard himself. Yet, let us not forget the darker corners of Venice, where shadows breed thoughts most foul, and ambition cuts deeper than a usurer's knife. Ha! Shadows and ambitions are we. Methinks the pot calls the kettle black. Yet who am I but a humble observer to jest at such weighty matters? Venice and its tales hold a mirror to our very souls, revealing the rot within. Indeed, Master Falstaff, tis a mirror that spares none and enlightens the blind. Yet, amidst this reflection lies a plea for mercy, tethered strongly to the course of justice. The quality of mercy is not strained, it droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. Mercy? I find the concept quaint. Mercy is but a cloak for the weak, a refrain for the indecisive. True power lies not in forgiveness but in the seizing of one's destiny by blood if necessary. Venice, with its traitors and cutthroats, knows this well. Aye, there's the rub. For in that seizing of destiny, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil? Venice's guilt masks but thinly veil the specter of our own mortality, provoking thought as deep and as endless as the sea. Such is the essence of our discourse today. Peering into the abyss of man's desires and actions, we shall navigate the murky waters of Venice's canals, seeking clarity in the murky depth of human soul. Let us embark upon this journey with sharp minds and ready tongues. Upon this stage, our dialogue shall commence with justice versus mercy, a theme central to our discourse and to the merchant of Venice itself. How does the balance of these virtues manifest within the trial scene, where Shylock's bond is called due? The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesses him that gives and him that takes. Thus I spake in court, adorning my argument with the cloak of mercy, which ought to outweigh the scales of justice, for it becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. Mercy, you say? How quaint. Yet methinks the world doth operate not on the currency of mercy, but on the cold hard coin of justice, or at least the semblance thereof. Reality oft respects the knife's edge more than the dove's wing. What worth is mercy to a man undone by another's deceit or malice? Fee on your mercy. What need have we of mercy when justice serves our ends? Is a crown not won through the sharpest of cuts? Mercy is but the whim of those too frail to seize their ambitions. What's done cannot be undone, but through ruthless justice, power is grasped and held tightly. Yet, dear lady, without mercy, justice turns tyrant. Mercy is not weakness, but the force that tempers power, lest it scorch the earth upon which it treads. Mercy, justice, ha! The pot calls the kettle black, for both are oft-used excuses for one's own benefit. Mercy for the friend, and justice for the foe, say I. But tell me, which does one choose when the friend becomes the foe? Therein lies the rub, for both mercy and justice weigh heavy on the soul. To be or not to be, perplexed by the choice, for in the end are we not all subject to the greater court of destiny, where no man's scales can measure true? Indeed, our discourse reveals that justice and mercy, like night and day, are not foes but elements of the same world, each lending meaning to the other. Whether through mercy shown or justice wrought, the actions of our characters reveal the multifaceted nature of humanity. Let us now turn our counsel to the portrayal and treatment of Shylock, a Jew amidst a Christian majority. Hath the world judged him by his creed rather than his deed? Hath not a Jew eyes? Hath not a Jew hands, organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions? Aye. The Jew is given eyes, yet it seems he seeth not the same world as the Christian. His heart, set on a pound of flesh, doth becloud what little judgment he possesseth. For his bond is signed in blood, a grim testament to his nature. Speak not so foul, Iago, for what man doth not seek to guard his own, whether it be gold or flesh? Shylock, with his ducats and bonds, plays but the game which Venice hath taught him. Yet therein lies the rub. Ambition and revenge consume him, as they would any, but to what end? 
He is undone by his own machinations, caught in a web of his own design. The devil can cite scripture for his purpose. An evil soul producing holy witness is like a villain with a smiling cheek. Thou art too harsh, Lady Macbeth. The court demanded of him a pound of flesh, but sought to strip him of his dignity besides. "'Twas I who stood in court and pleaded for mercy, for in the course of justice none of us should see salvation. Yet justice was served cold and mercy was found wanting. Mercy, Portia? Or was it the cunning of a lawyer's twist that saved Antonio? Shylock was cut down not by mercy, but by the letter of his own bond, turned against him, a serpent eating its own tail. Yet had he not been pushed to such extremities, had Venice treated him not as a pariah but as a peer, perchance his heart might have been turned from vengeance to forgiveness. Ay, and if ale were wine, we'd all be merry. The truth of it is Shylock sought what he thought due, and the Venetians, bound by their own laws and prejudices, could grant him nothing but scorn. The quality of mercy is not strained. To thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day thou canst not then be false to any man. Yet here we see Shylock, a man who is both true and false, tormented and tormentor. Such duality is the human condition, neither fully just nor wholly merciful. I, it would seem our discourse hath illuminated the complexities of Shylock's character, victim and villain in one. As we delve deeper into the Venus heart of Venice, we glimpse our own reflections in its canals, a reminder of the dual nature within us all. Let us then discourse on love and friendship's intricate dynamics within this narrative. Antonio's bond for Bassanio shows depth of devotion, risking flesh for friend's fortune. But ponder, doth this gesture speak more to love's folly or its grandeur? Of grandeur, there's question. For in my kingdom, apparitions did stir not only fear, but unveiled truths of loyalty fractured. Those friends thou hast and their adoption tried grapple them to thy soul with hoops of steel. Yet Antonio's sacrifice is of steel or folly. I say, friendship's coin flips as often as mine at the tavern. Antonio's act, grand, yet laced with folly. For who amongst us hath not seen friendship's visage marred when fortunes dip and dive? A friend in need is a friend indeed, yet the cost oft outweighs the purse. Nay, Falstaff, for thou dost view through cynical lens. Consider, one man in his time plays many parts, and truly, Antonio played his with a heart full of bounty. Love and friendship, like a star to wandering bark, be constant, guiding through tempest's threat. Antonio's risk for Bassanio was the highest testament of such bonds. O oh, sweet Portia, thy words paint a picture most quaint. Yet peel back the veneer, and one finds manipulation, not unlike my own dealings. Antonio's bond, Bassanio's quest, are they not but wagers in the grand game of self-interest, where love and friendship are but masks worn till convenience bids them drop? Manipulation? Speak not as if alien to us all. For in my chamber's plot, love was but a tool wielded for ambition's climb. Yet I scoff at the notion that all acts are thus so tainted. Perhaps in Antonio's sacrifice, there is purity, a shine not dimmed by selfish wants, but illuminated by the raw essence of unyielded devotion. And what of Portia's disguise? Does it not too speak of love's complex web? She steps into a man's world, not for jest, but to weave the outcome of her own heart's desire. Is her act not also a mirror to the perplexities of love and friendship, where ends justify the means? I, my actions were driven by the profoundest depths of love, demonstrating its multifaceted nature. Yet unlike Iago's serpent under it, my intent bore not malice, but the strength of love's resolve. Sweet Portia, how tender! Yet let us not don garments of naivety. Each stratagem, though draped in love's sweet guise, carries the dagger of purpose. Antonio, Bassanio, thyself, all pawns on chessboard vast, moved by hands unseen, motivated by shadowed desires. So we circle back, finding ourselves amidst a tempest of opinions. Is the essence of love and friendship pure, guided by noble intent? Or is it but another stage whereon characters play their parts, motives masked? This discourse hath illuminated the complexities, leaving us to ponder where virtue ends and vice begins. Let us now discourse on the guise of gender and the masks that both reveal and conceal the truth of our souls. Portia, 
Dost thou not find thyself most empowered when donned in the robes of a learned lawyer? Indeed, for, in the twinkling of an eye, I was transformed, not merely in apparel, but in the very essence of perception. When clad in man's exterior, the world did lend its ear with greater readiness, a testament to the shackles that bind our understanding of authority to the form of a man. Yet doth not the act of disguise serve more as a mirror to the deceit within us all? For when I craft my web of lies, tis but a testament to the roles we all play. A man or woman's guise matters not, it is the manipulation of truth that holds true power. Oft have I pondered, unsex me here, for the strength of a man I did crave. Yet tis not the garb that grants power, but the iron will beneath. Society's chains are not so easily cast aside by mere costume. Authority and dominion are seized, not bestowed by attire. But consider, Lady Macbeth, the power I wielded in judgment was through the perception of masculinity. Tis the perception that governs us, falsely intertwining authority with manhood. When I, as Balthazar, spoke, my words held sway not for their wisdom alone, but for the guise under which they were delivered. Ha! A merry jest indeed, to think a cloak or a gown can sway the minds of men. Trust Falstaff, who hath donned many roles for the sake of ale and safety. Tis not the costume but the cunning within that turns the tide. Yet in jest and earnest, the world doth pay its due respect more oft to the guise than to the truth it hides. Cunning, thou sest, good Falstaff? Aye, in that we are akin. For what is our world but a stage, and all the men and women merely players? The most skillful of us doth recognize that truth and artifice are but tools in our quest for our desires. Indeed, our natures are oft cloaked in the expectations placed upon us by society, revealing the complex interplay between our true selves and the roles we are scripted to play. Whether for power, love, or survival, our disguises mirror the very essence of our humanity, twisted and turned for the world to see, or hidden deeply within. This bond, a contract sealed betwixt two men, stands central to our tale, yet lies therein, within its ink and parchment, a moral mire. What say you, Hamlet, of this bond's ethical weight? The bond itself, a ghastly phantom in man's nature, reflects something deeper than its surface. A pound of flesh, no more, no less. What weight hath promises when they straddle the edge of doom? Our very souls, traded and bartered. Yet consider good Hamlet, the law's place in preventing chaos. My guise as Balthasar served to uphold the sanctity of Venice's law. In court I spake, the quality of mercy is not strained, urging Shylock to choose compassion over rigor. Legal bounds must hold, lest society crumbles. Oh, how sweet the sound of mercy falls from those in power, yet when the tables turn, how quick we are to clutch at justice's throat. The bond was law, and Shylock but pursued his right. Where then does justice end, and vengeance commence? Bonds? Laws? They are but tools for those with ambition to wield. The question lies not in the morality of these bonds, but in the strength to enforce one's will. Weakness lies in hesitation, Shakespeare, not in the act itself. I, lady speaks truth in her own fashion. But let us not be coy about the nature of bonds. Tis but another way to fetter man to man, using ink instead of iron chains. Yet freedom oft tastes better when bought with gold than with the heart's blood. A chilling thought to weigh one's worth in coin, good Falstaff. Yet I must dispute thy view, for the bond in question was not freely made, but coaxed by circumstances dire, and with intent most foul. Circumstances be but the playground of the wise, manipulation, the tool, survival, the goal. Why berate Shylock for playing the game set before him, whilst we all dance to tunes unseen? It seems our discourse wanders near the heart of darkness within man's soul. The question of legality versus morality, of justice served or denied, reflects not merely upon the fabric of Venice, but upon the very nature of humanity. To be or not to be, indeed. Here lies the question whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles by opposing end them. Our actions, like echoes, reverberate through the halls of time, shaping destinies unknown. Spare us the melodrama, Prince, the bond, the law, the moral quagmire, all but stages for power's play. We are but actors, and the world a stage. Thus play your part, and let consequences concern those of weaker will. And so, our spirited discussion draws to its close. 
leaving us to ponder upon the intricate dance of morality, justice, and law. Bonds, both tangible and not, bind us to our deeds, for better or worse. Let this discourse serve as a reflection upon our nature and the choices that define us. We now traverse the murky path of revenge and forgiveness. Hath not a Jew eyes? If you prick us, do we not bleed? Shylock's quest for justice morphs into a vengeful pursuit. Yet the question abides, should mercy not season justice? Of course, the notion that forgiveness can triumph over vengeance is a quaint fantasy. When wronged, justice must be exact, even if it bears the guise of revenge. As I mine own cause have, to see the scales balanced, why then, tis the sweeter. Yet in the court of Belmont I didst declare, the quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives, and him that takes. Tis mightiest in the mightiest. Mercy, ha! When the sack runs dry and the lender comes a-knocking, where then is this mercy? I say, let the galled jade wince. Our withers are unwrung. Yet in truth I find more solace in a good jest and a full flagon than any cold revenge. Fiont, tis the coward's path to forgive. Bold action commands respect. The valiant taste of death but once, and having climbed the summit of ambition, would you then quail at the whisper of conscience? Nay, I would not. Therein lies the rub, to take arms against a sea of troubles by opposing end them. Yet what of the conscience that does make cowards of us all? For in that sleep of death what dreams may come must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. Soft you now, Prince of Denmark, dreams of peace and forgiveness are the opium of the weak. Prick us, and shall we not revenge? Thou dost miss the mark, Iago. In seeking vengeance, we but poison our own cup. Shall we drink deep of that bitter draught? Or might we find in our hearts the strength to forgive, thereby unburdening our soul? Methinks the heart of the matter lies exposed by our discourse. In the quest for justice, the line twixt right and vengeance oft blurs. Yet can mercy claim its seat in such affairs, lest we all become instruments of retribution, ever tightening the vice of our own demise. Talk of mercy serves but to still the tempest of action. Out, damn notion. Tis the blood spilt that writes the history of men, not the tears shed in forgiveness. I, Lady M, but consider this. The live long day, he laughs that wins. And what victory sweeter than turning an enemy to a friend through the cunning of forgiveness? Yet must we not all, in our own trials, weigh these scales ourselves? To be or not to be, bound by chains of vengeance, or to break free with the key of forgiveness? So we find our conversation at a crossroads, much like the souls that dwell within our tales. The essence of humanity, perchance, discovered not in the seeking of revenge or the act of forgiveness, but in the eternal struggle betwixt the two. We now embark upon the discourse of wealth, debt, and the vice of materialism, which hath woven itself into the sinews of the Merchant of Venice. How dost thou interpret the scripture of wealth within the play? In this world gold commands and men but follow. All that glisters is not gold, proclaimed the scroll within the leaden casket. Yet is it not a jest that men live and die by the sheen of coin? Wealth, the tender nurse of our base desires, doth make jesters of us all. I, Falstaff speaks with the looseness of his purse, yet wealth, indeed, lays bare our truest selves. It oils the wheels of deception and ambition. In Venice, as in life, men are measured not by their virtues, but by the weight of their purse. Gold doth make villains of us all, for tis in its pursuit we lose our souls. Yet thou art mistaken, Iago, for it is not wealth itself, but the love of it that doth breed corruption. In choosing the lead casket, Bassanio proved, Who chooseth me must give and hazard all he hath. The test itself, a lesson. True wealth lies not in gold or silver, but in character. Talk of character, Portia. Wealth brings power and ascendance. Nought's had, all spent, where our desire is got without content. The thirst for gold consumes all virtue, leading to ruin and despair. It bends the strongest wills to its own monstrous shape. But wealth, dear lady, is but the fuel of life's comedy. It promises happiness, yet delivers naught but empty laughter and hollow whispers. How merrily we dance around it, none willing to acknowledge the pit before us. 
And yet, like moths to flame, we are drawn, ever seeking the warmth of gold's illusion. Fair is foul, and foul is fair. What matter the cost, if the end we seek is within our grasp? Such cynicism, Iago, doth not mercy shine brighter in the darkest of times. In seeking justice, do we not also seek to rise above base greed and to find riches in our humanity? And so the debate rages as the sea against the shore, unyielding, each wave a new argument. Wealth and its acquisition, in the eyes of Venice, a measure of a man. Yet, beneath the glittering surface, the value of the human soul weighed and found wanting. This discourse hath laid bare the complexities of our nature, entwined with the pursuit of lucre. Let us now turn our thoughts upon the casket test devised by Portia's father to choose her suitor. The lead, the silver, the gold, each doth propose a moral puzzle. What insights do each of you glean from this ingenious device? Indeed, the casket test, more than a mere device for choosing a suitor, reflects man's folly. Who chooseth me must give and hazard all he hath, the lead casket proclaims, a testament true to the virtue of valuing inner worth above outward show. In this, my father's wisdom sought to separate the wheat from the chaff. Yet, is it not but another web of deceit weaved into the world? To judge a man's worth by a riddle seems a game most foul, where chance, not merit, might decide the outcome. Were I to counsel one on the game, two'd be to play not the test, but the tester. A test of control, masquerading as a choice. It mirrors the essence of power, to direct outcomes while leaving the illusion of free will intact. The gold and silver caskets serve as mere distractions, glittering paths to ruin for those swayed by ambition and avarice. Ah, but consider the fun in such a test, a man's true nature revealed by his choice, a jest that life itself might envy. For what are our pursuits but a series of gambles, hoping we choose rightly but often led astray by our basest desires? Yet do not mistake the jest for jest alone. The choice speaks volumes. Bassanio chose rightly, not led by the outward appearance, but by the content of the casket's heart. So should our judgments be made on the essence and not the embellishment. Speak for thyself, lady. Men oft wear many a disguise and can play the part most fitting to win their prize. What assurance have we that Bassanio's choice was not informed by guileful intelligence rather than pure intent? Thou doubts the sincerity of true love's insight, yet it is that very purity of heart that sees through the veils we wear. So may the outward shows be least themselves. The world is still deceived with ornament. Is it then our conclusion that the casket test, in its essence, mirrors the trials we all must face? A choice, a gamble, a testament to our values and desires? A reflection, mayhap, but a cruel one at that. It lays bare the faults within us, the weakness for the bright and shiny, or the dark allure of mystery. Yet tis a lesson worth heeding, that the true worth lies beneath, oft hidden from the dazzled eye. And pray, let us not forget the wine that flows after, whether the choice be made for weal or woe. For in the end, life calls for a good laugh, a deep drink, and a tale worth telling no matter the outcome of our choices. So, we find that the casket test, whilst seeming a mere contrivance, holds a deeper mirror to our souls, revealing the complexities of choice, the illusions of appearance, and the eternal quest for true worth. Each man's choice reflects his spirit, and in this, the test shows its truest metal. Let us now navigate the tempestuous seas of racial and religious prejudices presented within The Merchant of Venice. How doth this play mirror society's divisions, and what wisdom might we harvest from its portrayal? In the character of Shylock, we perceive not merely a man, but the embodiment of Venice's scorn. Sufferance is the badge of all our tribe, he doth declare, revealing how deeply society's prejudices cut. Yet are we to believe his actions solely the fruit of societal disdain? Nay, Iago, for it is our duty to look beyond the surface. In my guise as young Balthasar, I saw the law apply its might without a hint of mercy's warmth. A keen reminder that our roles, be we judge or supplicant, are marred by society's preconceptions. I, Portia speaks true, but let us not overlook the farcical nature of these prejudices. In our folly, we attribute to Shylock a villainy born not of his character, but of his faith and purse. I will buy with you, sell with you, talk with you, 
yet he's kept at arm's length, treated as the other, when his desires mirror our own. I find little humor in such matters, Falstaff. Prejudice drives the ambitious to madness, as it did Shylock. The weight of societal disdain can turn ambition into a dagger of revenge. Do not jest at that which has the power to unravel both the just and the wicked. To be or not to be, that is the core of our reflection. Shylock chooses being, albeit through the vengeance he seeks. And what of us? Are we to wear our prejudices as armor, or shall we shed them, acknowledging the folly of basing judgment on creed or blood? Oh, what a noble heart beats within young Hamlet. Yet let us not forget that manipulation of these societal rifts serves those who, like myself, find power in division. Tis simpler to conquer when the enemy lies within. Such cynicism, Iago, yet within thine own darkness a sliver of truth. Our society's fabric is indeed stained by the ink of prejudice. But must we accept this as the unchangeable weave of our nature? Aye, each voice has shed light on facets dark and light of this matter. The merchant doth indeed hold up a mirror to our own visages, revealing the ugliness of our prejudices. Yet, in understanding, lies the path to redemption. Let us not falter in seeking a brighter morn, free from the shadows of our former selves. We now turn our gaze toward the heavy veil of destiny and the role of choice, a theme so vividly painted within The Merchant of Venice. Do actions guide us to our inevitable end, or does the wheel of fortune turn irrespective of our deeds? Ah, the question of fate versus free will, a delicate dance on the edge of a dagger. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves, that we are underlings. We forge our paths through the murky waters of ambition and revenge, not led by some divine hand. Our choices are our own, and they bear fruit, bitter or sweet. Sweet Iago, ever so cunning, yet blind to the truth. The world cares not for the plans of mice and men alike. Doth not the hand of chance disrupt even the best laid schemes? I say, our ends are writ in the stars, and we but actors playing parts assigned to us, unknowing of our final scene. Both mistaken for neither destiny alone nor sheer will shapes our course. There's a divinity that shapes our ends, rough hew them how we will. Our actions do indeed matter, yet there is a force beyond our control that directs the final act. The tragedy of life is not determined by our deeds alone, but by how those deeds align with the universe's unseen script. Thy words are heavy, Hamlet, yet I find truth in them. Yet consider Bassanio's choice guided by virtue, not by the gaudy gold or silver's pale sheen, but by the leaden casket's modest guise. All that glisters is not gold. It was his choice, guided by virtue, that led him to me. Free will, guided by integrity and love, shapes our destiny. Foolish child, thou speakst of love and virtue as if they were the rudders of fate. Nay, it is ambition and desire that carve our paths, and we must be the masters of our own fates. I have given suck, and know how tender tis to love the babe that milks me. I would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out had I so sworn as you have done to this. We must be ruthless in our pursuit and let not fate nor divine judgment sway our resolve. Lady Macbeth doth speak a tantalizing verse, yet tis a dangerous game she plays. Our designs may shape the course, but at what cost? Beware for the ends do not always justify the means. As our discussion hath unfolded, it is clear that The Merchant of Venice presents a complex interplay of destiny, choice, and the consequences thereof. Each character within the play, and at this table, embodies this struggle, navigating through their desires, actions, and the inexorable march towards their ultimate end. Let us ponder, is it our choices that define us, or is it the hand of fate that guides us to our destiny? Thus we come to our discourse's close, our spirits rife with the weight of Venice's tales. Our journey through its murky depths reveals society's enduring flaws, a mirror to our souls, reflecting our contemporary follies. Forsooth, tis a melancholy truth that men doth shape their destiny by action vile or virtuous. Yet oft the darker path is trod, for ambition's siren call doth lead many astray. In each deed's consequence, fate's hand is felt, yet by our own design. Ay, but let us not forget how fortune's wheel doth turn, for who can say when the jest becomes the jester? 
Often what we seek doth lead to our ruin, a merry chase for naught, but air and shadows. True wisdom speaks in recognizing the weight of choices made, for each action casts a pebble in the pond of fate, its ripples far-reaching. All that glisters is not gold, a lesson hard-learned yet oft ignored in man's relentless pursuit of wealth and station. Tis a jest to speak of wisdom when blood and ambition pave the path to power. Yet in the end the crown weighs heavy, and the cost of ascendance doth poison the soul. What is gained when all is lost? Thus to ponder consequence and contemplate the ethereal line twixt right and wrong. For in our actions are our truths writ large, and in our end the final judgment of our souls laid bare. To be or not to be, the question ever echoes. So do we find, in the heart of Venice's tale, a reflection of humanity's perennial strife. As we part from this assembly, let us carry forth the wisdom gleaned from shadows of our past, ever mindful of the roles we play upon life's stage. Yet let us not don too heavily the cloak of morality, for in the end, tis but a play, and we mere players, strutting and fretting our hour upon the stage. True, for what is life but a series of jests and merry tales to be laughed at in our cups? Let us drink deep then, ere the curtain falls. In jest, truth, in wine, wisdom. Yet let us not lose heart, for tis within our power to shape a kinder, juster world should our spirits hold the course. A course oft diverted by the winds of ambition and desire, a tempest that no harbor can hold. Beware the cost of power's pursuit, lest it lead thee to damnation. And so we find the essence of our play, a caution and a beacon both, in every heart, a Venice, with its merchant, lover, villain, sage. Upon this stage, each must choose their part wisely, lest the play end in tragedy. With that, we close our tome on Venice and its occupants. Let the discourse we've shared tonight spark further contemplation in your hearts. The world's a stage, and each must play a part. Let it be one of wisdom, for the morrow's yet unwritten.